to another of Matisse and Wickard and Lair's webinars. This one is entitled Understanding and Avoiding Spoliation. A lot of the topics that we present are pretty common and understood and things that are dealt with in everyday life for a claims handler, liability handler, subrogation professional. This subject uh, is a little different because not only is it misunderstood in terms of what spoliation is and its ramifications in every jurisdiction, but each jurisdiction is different and the law of spoliation changes from state to state. So we'll talk a little bit, a bit about uh, spoliation today, understanding and avoiding it. Uh, spoliation claims cost our industry hundreds of millions of dollars annually. And not only are carriers exposed to spoliation tort claims, many of my clients have had to pay large judgments for spoliation uh, torts uh, in those jurisdictions that recognize them. But careless investigation and the resulting spoliation of valuable evidence also costs our industry untold millions of dollars in lost subrogation, lost recovery opportunities, and reimbursement rights. Spoliation law is developing rapidly and affects every aspect of the claims process, from notice of claim to claim handling, loss investigation, coverage issues, liability defense, and subrogation. Uh, so although we will address much of spoliation from the subrogation perspective, what we're going to talk about is going to be equally applicable to both the claims process, investigation of claims large and small, and liability defense and liability handling from the insurance industry's perspective. Understanding the nuances of spoliation from state to state is no minor challenge, and knowing what steps are essential to avoiding its perils are essential to the claims handling process and will be covered in this webinar. This course will illustrate the creation and evolution of spoliation law, and because we have 50 jurisdictions to deal with, we are going to use Wisconsin as an example, provide a snapshot of spoliation law, not only in Wisconsin, but across all 50 states. So we hope that it's informative for you. Uh, we will have questions at time for questions at the end. Um, and uh, I've already gone through the preliminaries as to how to work the uh, screen sharing and, and the uh, controls that you have on your screen. So spoliation law. Um, spoliation law is uh, really a creation of lawyers, if you think about it. Uh, lawyers who run lawsuits and handle uh, third-party cases and liability claims uh, run into situations where their evidence is, is lost damaged, uh, or they are unable to present a claim or a defense. Um, it reminds me of a, a story about a lawyer that runs a stop sign and gets pulled over by a sheriff's deputy. He thinks that he's smarter than the deputy because, of course, he's a lawyer. So he decides to prove himself, uh, prove this to himself and have some fun at the deputy's expense. So the deputy says, Li license and registration, please, and the lawyer says, what for? The deputy says, you didn't come to a complete stop at the stop sign. The lawyer replies, I slowed down and no one was coming. The deputy said, but you still didn't come to a complete stop. License and registration, please. The lawyer then responds, well, what's the difference? The deputy says, the difference is you have to come to a complete stop. That's the law. License and registration, please. But the lawyer continues, if you can show me the legal difference between slow down and stop, I'll give you my license and registration and you can give me a ticket. If not, you let me go. How's that? The deputy says, exit your vehicle, sir. At this point, the deputy takes out his nightstick and starts to beat the, the, the bejesus out of the lawyer eventually. And then he finally says, do you want me to stop or slow down? Uh, so a, a lot of times, uh, creative lawyering is responsible for the evolution of uh, different bodies of law and claims. Parties who present or defend certain bodies of claims and spoliation is no different in that regard. We're going to be, uh, this will be a one-hour webinar today, uh, and we have a lot of ground to cover. And what's interesting is we have today 276 attendees, and that includes 17 conference rooms, which means that in these conference, conference rooms we can have anywhere from 10 to 20 or more individuals uh, viewing a common um, screen. So while we don't know exactly how many people are in attendance today, uh, the good news is that um, it is well attended. Um, if you are viewing this webinar 
live, you will be able to receive CE credit, uh, both in Texas and um, I think Montana, Wyoming, I think Wyoming, uh, which are universal states and the CE credits transfer well uh, across most of the states where CE credit is required. If you are not watching live and you are watching a recording of this, um, the, I believe the states do not allow CE credit, but do keep in mind that for future webinars that are presented, we do make available CE credit uh, for you. Now I'm going to, uh, with regard to the, the PowerPoint, spoliation is defined in Black's Law Dictionary as the intentional destruction, mutilation, alteration, or concealment of evidence. That's the definition Black gives us. In practice, it's really not quite that clear. Uh, the uh, spoliation is actually the intentional or negligent withholding, hiding, altering, or destruction of evidence relevant to a legal proceeding. The effect uh, on the civil justice system is that it undermines the truth-seeking function of that system. And the theory of spoliation is that when a party destroys evidence, it's reasonable to infer that that party had some motivations to destroy the evidence. Now, this obviously isn't true in the case of evidence which is simply lost, stolen, or negligently damaged. But that's the theory on which those states which recognize a tort of spoliation operate. Now, Spoliation is non-discriminatory. It has become another defense that is thrown at plaintiffs and subrogating plaintiffs, um, and it occurs as a result of actions by defendants and defendants' agents, but it, it, also, it also affects plaintiffs. So it is of, of equal concern to trial lawyers, injured parties, and subrogating plaintiffs uh, who maybe fall victim to the, the, uh, the acts of spoliation. The history of spoliation is that spoliation was not always a tort. In fact, prior to 1984, no state recognized the tort of spoliation, and California was the first state to recognize the tort of spoliation. Uh, if you are viewing this webinar live, you received a couple of handouts. One is the PowerPoint with room for notes. The second is a 22-page handout entitled spoliation of evidence in all 50 states. Uh, this is a short summary of the history of spoliation and a detailed analysis of the law of spoliation in every state. We're going to go through this quickly at the end of the webinar, but <clears throat> it is going to be a good and useful um, resource for you, um, a good, good and useful resource for you when uh, you have spoliation issues arise. Now, I wanted to uh, point out that on our website, those of you who are watching this recorded may not have the materials in front of you, but let me show you how you can get it. If you go to our website at www.mwl-law Dot com, you will be able to uh, take, go down to, on the left-hand side of the home page, if you can see where I'm scrolling down, and over here next to published articles, I'm going to use my highlighter here, here's, here's a section that's marked published insurance books, newsletters and articles, and these have all of our newsletters and articles. Um, but if you go down further under insurance resources, you can see here that we have a long list of charts from the societal benefits of subrogation, the Maidhold Doctrine, statutes of limitations in all 50 states, deductible reimbursement laws, MedPay PIP subrogation, economic loss doctrine, employee leasing, and so on and so forth. If you go down three-quarters of the way down, you'll see that there is a link here entitled Spoliation Laws in All 50 States. If you would, uh, and you're viewing this recorded, you can click on there and up will pop the 22-page handout that we're discussing 
in this webinar. Now, it may not be 22 pages uh, because we've constantly added to and updated, but um, it will at least be something that you can print off and use as a reference um, uh, in, the, in your handling of claims. So getting back to the, the PowerPoint, uh, spoliation is defined as the intentional destruction, mutilation, alteration, or concealment of evidence, according to Blacks. And we've learned that that's not totally correct, and that every state defines spoliation a little differently. What's important to know is that although in 1984, California became the first state to recognize the sport of the tort of spoliation, that was later overturned, and they no longer recognize it. Most states do not recognize an independent tort. And a tort, of course, is a civil wrong for which you can seek redress and damages. Um, Alabama, Alaska, Florida, Indiana, Kansas, Louisiana, Montana, New Mexico, Ohio, and West Virginia do recognize a tort of spoliation, which means that if, if either the, the uh, parties to a lawsuit or some other party with a duty to protect, preserve, or not to destroy or lose evidence does any of the above, they can be sued and damages can be recovered for damaging the lawsuit, which a party was not able to bring or prosecute or defend. There are two types of spoliation that we have to think about here. One is a first party spoliation case, which is rare. First party spoliation is brought against parties to a lawsuit. You are sued and hire an attorney be, be, uh, under a liability policy, CGL policy. Uh, you are a defendant in a lawsuit being sued by a plaintiff, or you are a plaintiff bringing a lawsuit against a defendant. A first party uh, uh, spoliation lawsuit is brought by one of the parties to a lawsuit against the other, specifically for negligence in spoliating evidence. On the other hand, a third party lawsuit, a third party tort of spoliation is brought against non-parties to the litigation, experts, warehouse people, um, employers, insurance, uh, evidence handlers, risk loss uh, people, uh, anybody who isn't a party to the litigation, that's what a third party um, spoliation uh, claim is. And uh, just we'll go over the different states and the, the way that they handle spoliation, but just as a point of reference, if you're going to spoliate, spoliate in Utah where they haven't even heard of the tort and do not spoliate in West Virginia where not only do you uh, have a tort for spoliation, but you can recover punitive damages as well. Now, sanctions for spoliation. And by the way, spoliation comes from the word despoil, D-E-S-P-O-I-L, meaning to sack or plunder. Uh, you deprive something of value by force. That's where the, the term spoliation comes from. But uh, the sanctions for spoliation are really only two. There are a few states that have criminal sanctions, and, cri and, and spoliating evidence is a criminal law, especially if it's done or if it's done intentionally. But usually not. There are usually only two recourses. If, if you have spoliation of evidence, you can get an adverse inference. Uh, this is uh, where the jury is given an instruction. For example, all things are pre presumed against the party who did the spoliating. Even if it, the, the party didn't, but an agent of that party did, like an expert or an insurance claims handler. Uh, if evidence is, is spoiled, you can get an adverse inference by the judge, and those are hard to overcome. Uh, as an example, I tried a fire case in Milwaukee County, a large fire loss in which uh, a low-voltage uh, intermatic timer uh, caused, uh, over time, a breakdown of the, uh, uh, the plastic housing of the intermatic controller and resulted in it melting, and the melting plastic dropped onto some combustibles and started a fire. Well, in that case, the fire department came in and threw out all of the wires leading up to, <coughs> excuse me, leading up to the high voltage uh, input on the intermatic timer. Now, uh, the insurance company who hired me to try that property subrogation case had nothing to do with that, but the judge felt that. Um, because the defendant was present, prevented from uh, presenting a defense and because he was 
the defendant was unable to show, Intermatic was unable to show that it was actually a short in the wires that caused the fire, which of course we didn't agree with. Um, they were given an instruction by the jury, and we um, we lost that case uh, on a, a I think it was an eight to four decision. But the jurors I think were a little confused after that instruction and failed to realize that they could find the product defective if the marketing, the instructions and the manuals were defective. But that's an aside. So sanctions can be, you can get an adverse inference or in more strenuous cases and usually where you have intentional actions uh, or gross negligence, you can get a dismissal. The court can actually strike introduction of evidence into a case and where the evidence struck consists of the actual product that's at question, you clearly are going to have a hard time making your case as a plaintiff. On the other hand, the court, the case can also be dismissed because the party cannot meet its burden of proof. Or the case can be dismissed outright for spoliation. So those are two of the typical sanctions that you can receive for spoliation. It's important to re remember that defendants, when investigating a loss, focus on uh, spoliation of evidence and alternative theories other than the one the plaintiff is espousing. As plaintiffs, and this would include subrogation professionals, we must remember that we have a triple duty. We have to not only prove and focus on our theory of the case, a working theory, but we also should, just like the defendant, should focus on alternative theories and avoiding spoliation. And most importantly, avoiding allegations of spoliation because in fire losses or catastrophic injury cases with explosions and machinery, it's often easy for a defendant to point to anything, any one of a number of appliances or equipment or apparati in close proximity to, the, uh, to where the accident happened, um, come up with a theory as to why that particular item caused the injury, and then lament that, oh, unfortunately, that particular product or instrumentality did not make it out of the fire. So they have the luxury of being able, able to pick and choose whatever didn't survive as the culprit in causing the fire. Now the story of uh, the story of spoliation, and we're going to start with Wisconsin as an example. And we are going to start in Wisconsin not because we practice here, uh, because in reality I do more litigation outside of Wisconsin than I do inside of Wisconsin. But we're going to use Wisconsin as an example because Wisconsin has a very storied history of spoliation and actually has a conclusion. And by that I mean there is a case which finally answers a lot of the questions which exist in most states, still open questions that have yet to be answered. So the story of spoliation is really the story of creation followed by the evolution of spoliation because it was created out of thin air essentially in 1993. And it was created in the case of Milwaukee Constructors versus Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. For those of you who are familiar with Wisconsin, Milwaukee being Wisconsin's largest city, um, this, uh, this case arose out of um, a $2.8 billion deep tunnel system crosstown interceptor sewerage project which ran from 1984 to 1993. The Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District contracted with Milwaukee Constructors as part of its water pollution abatement program. They were having problems with, uh, with sewerage, sewage and wastewater and what they did is in three different sections they bored 100 meters below the ground 20 miles of tunnels. They had to drill through Silurian H, Niagara, Dolostone, a very finicky uh, mineral. And the karstic nature of this Dolostone resulted in rock collapses and soil intrusion, primarily because of poor hydrology studies. So there was a lot of legal tension between the parties. And as you can imagine, uh, Milwaukee constructors had to line 45% of these 20 miles of tunnels at the cost of an extra $50 million 
and delaying the project by a year. So it suffered about $32 million in damages and sued Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, alleging that uh, both the MMSD and its engineers forced the plaintiff, Milwaukee constructors, to use expensive and time-consuming methods that weren't anticipated. They filed suits in 1987. In 1990, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, MMSD, discovered that one of, it, one of plaintiff's employees named Lyle Pearson had authorized the disposal of 700 banker's boxes of documents stored in a warehouse owned by Archives, Inc. MMSD filed a motions for, motion for sanctions because there were still some 3,200 banker's boxes of documents left. The allegation was that the 700 banker's boxes of documents that were destroyed contained key evidence necessary to the defense of the case. The trial courts in Milwaukee held three hearings over the course of several months, and there were two additional months of discovery conducted relating solely to the destruction of these documents. <clears throat> the court, um, the trial court, dismissed the complaint in its entirety and awarded costs and attorney's fees against the plaintiff for these actions. Of course, Milwaukee constructors appealed this, and the Court of Appeal, on appeal, held that there needed to be evidence of willful, willful destruction in order to dismiss a case. The appellate court said that you have to have an intentional and egregious conduct or a knowing disregard of ju the ju judicial process in order for there to be an outright dismissal. Uh, the needs of the parties to the lost evidence must be taken into consideration, and the court also said that they also need, they need to look at whether the documents that were lost actually impair uh, the present claim or defense of the case. And what they noted in this case was that the 700 bankers' boxes of documents actually related more to the plaintiff's financial condition than it did to the actual uh, construction of the contracts involved in the deep tunnel system project. So we have no sanctions for negligence foliation here. And because there was not intentional or egregious conduct or a knowing disregard of the judicial process, the court said you cannot dismiss the case. We then move on from, from that case to the year 1995. And this case is entitled Century Insurance Company versus Royal Insurance Company. And it is a very confusing and misinterpreted case, at least in the state of Wisconsin is a case that is cited by defendants for um, the prospect that you can have dismissal even with mere negligent actions despite the holding of the uh, Milwaukee constructors case which we just discussed. So the Century case involved the following. There was a fire at the Brown County home of Linda Schwally. The Century Insurance Company insured that home and paid $100,000 for damages. It turned out after investigating that the fire was caused by a Frigidaire refrigerator manufactured by General Motors. The refrigerator was stored by Century in a warehouse, and Century hired an expert named Thomas Ebert to examine the refrigerator. Uh, this expert looked at the refrigerator and removed certain parts that it felt were essential to its theory of the case. In particular, Mr. Ebert removed a burn capacitor, a timing motor, wire assembly attached to a compressor, a compressor thermostat, an upper limit thermostat, and a compressor on-off switch. And it was the opinion of this expert that the failure of the refrigerator was the result of a failure of a capacitor, timing motor, and a timing motor switch. Well, the fire department, when investigating this fire, had, as they often do, opined haphazardly in its report that the fire started because of a, quote, short in the wires, close quote, in the bottom of the refrigerator. Uh, often they do more harm than good with these sort of uh, off-the-cuff uh, diagnoses and cause and origin reports, but the defendant in this case, Royal Insurance Company, looked at that and said, well, we would like to have the bottom of the fridge to find out if there was a short in these wires, as the fire department said. Royal made a request, or actually, Royal made no request for, uh, to inspect this refrigerator for over a year, however. 
And after a year, it finally requested the right-hand door, which was not available. It had been removed and discarded. The plaintiffs filed suit three years later, and Royal Insurance Company still had conducted no inspection. The refrigerator had long since been put in a landfill and disposed of because Century's expert had removed the parts he thought were relevant to the loss. Century claimed that the disposal of the refrigerator was done without its authority, that it had told this warehouse to retain the refrigerator, but the point was really moot because the, the warehouse was actually the agent of Century in this case, and its actions would be held against Century Insurance Company. At trial, the trial court prevented introduction of any evidence of the refrigerator's condition. Now, you can imagine, whether you're on the defense side or the plaintiff's side, how devastating that is to a case. <clears throat> if you have a product case involving a product, not being able to introduce evidence of that product's condition is tantamount to a death sentence for your case. You simply will not be able to prove what happened. Century appealed this decision. And the Court of Appeals said that these sanctions were appropriate because Royal Insurance Company could not inspect the refrigerator. They then went on to add some very unfortunate language. They said the disposal of the refrigerator was, quote, at least negligent, but that the removal of the component parts was intentional. And the court said that it was OK for the trial court to preclude evidence of the condition of the refrigerator. Now, this was devastating for Century in this case, but it led to confusion over the spoliation standard because the court did not resolve whether or not a negligent or an intentional act had to be present in order to essentially give the death sentence to a, a case due to spoliation. Um, this case arguably dealt with negligent conduct, but the court found that it dealt with intentional conduct. Nonetheless, this Sentry case, for a number of years, was very confusing and has been cited by numerous defendants to the uh, effect that even negligent conduct, conduct can result in de facto dismissal of a case, when in fact that was not the standard set forth in the uh, Milwaukee Constructors case that we discussed earlier. So from 1995 until 1999, there was a lot of confusion. And then we had the case of Garfoot versus Fireman's Fund. Um, this is a case which uh, the incident occurred in September of 1995. And a plaintiff, a homeowner, was hurt by a propane gas explosion while trying to light a pilot light on his hot water heater at home. The explosion injured the homeowner. And within two hours, a friend of the plaintiff called an attorney named Pamela Lunder, who is a friend of both uh, the friend of the plaintiff and the plaintiff himself. Lunder, the attorney, called an expert named Harry Balch with Associated Engineers to come and inspect the explosion site. Balch, in turn, retained General Heating to provide a technician for the inspection. General Heating is a company who is familiar with this type of hot water heater. But as it turned out, this technician had no experience in pressure testing liquid propane systems. Now, we all become scientists as a result of our cases, the handling of our cases. And this case involved the science of um, liquid propane systems. And those of you who are involved with, li with propane fires and explosions know that all propane piping connections and fittings use a pipe joint compound which expands under pressure and retracts when the system loses pressure, causing leaks. Um, so if you have a loss of pressure, such as gas interruption and, or an out of gas situation, uh, many states require testing as a matter of law before you can repressurize and, and re-send um, uh, gas into the system. So. A testing of an LP gas system tests the integrity of the plumbing joints and the seal of the pump pipe joint compound. What happened in this case is the target defendant was a pipe installer and inspector. And the plaintiffs were alleging that two of the joints uh, had leaks. Well, this technician that was hired by uh, with General Heating that was hired by Henry Balch, the expert for the plaintiff, 
went in, disconnected, capped, and then later reconnected two joints out of several joints that were in this liquid propane system. Uh, this ruined them for testing, and the, the defendants could no longer test to prove whether they did or did not have leaks. All of the other joints that were not uh, compromised tested okay, no leaks, but the plaintiff's main theory of the case was that the two joints that were negligently tested had leaks. So, of course, the defendant claimed that the plaintiff released gas into the room negligently. The plaintiff claimed that gas got into the room from these two leaky joints, but it couldn't prove it because the, the, jo the joints were compromised. Uh, the trial court barred evidence of the leaks in those two joints and finally rectified the Sentry case, the confusing case where we didn't know whether intentional or negligent action was sufficient, it justified and modified that case, rectifying it with the Milwaukee construction case, um, which, and, and the Court of Appeals ultimately said that there must be egregious conduct, which in this context consists of a conscious attempt to affect the outcome of litigation or a flagrant knowing disregard of the judicial process in order for there to be a de facto dismissal of a case. You can still, with negligent conduct, give an adverse inference, as we discussed earlier, but you cannot dismiss a case for spoliation unless there is intentional, egregious conduct. Um, but, but as I said, the courts still have discretionary authority to sanction for negligence. Now, from, from that day on, through the years 2001 to 2004 to 2007, <clears throat> we had a series of cases which uh, were uh, decided in Wisconsin, and they crystallized the fact that you can have dismissal when you have intentional egregious acts or a flagrant knowing disregard for the judicial process but only mere sanctions, such as a negligent inference, when the destruction of evidence was negligent. And these sanctions include, as we discussed, pretrial discovery sanctions, or most commonly, a negative inference instruction. So these three cases that are before you affirmed the fact that you need an intentional act for dismissal. Now, these questions begged, or these cases begged the question of, if we have a duty to preserve evidence, what, what constitutes a breach of that duty? Because as we indicated in my case, my fire case that I tried in Milwaukee involving intramatic uh, timing, an uh, intramatic timer, even the acts of a firefighter or mere negligence in not collecting every scrap of wire at a fire scene can lead to allegations and most often will lead to allegations by a defendant that you spoliated the scene and did not preserve the necessary evidence. Later in this webinar, we will get into what you need to do to prevent that from happening, but we're now going through the evolution of spoliation. So questions arose as, early, as, as recent as 2007, under what circumstances can evidence be destroyed? We also were, are curious about what notice had to be given to a civil litigant before evidence can be destroyed. And no, no matter what efforts we lifted ourselves to, the defendant would always claim that it wasn't quite enough. But these questions were finally answered by the Wisconsin Supreme Court on July 15th of 2009. And on July 15th of 2009, the Supreme Court decided the case of American Family versus Gulkey Brothers. This case involved a, two, a uh, February 12th of 2000 fire which destroyed the home of David Ronaldson. American Family insured that home and paid $165,000 to rebuild it. Now, uh, before we get into the facts of this case, it's important to remind ourselves that fire cases, explosion cases, flood losses are difficult cases because um, physics, acts of God, fire, and, and nature itself works against us to destroy, carry away, eliminate, and spoliate evidence all on its own. Um, and so fire cases are difficult. And in fire cases in particular, which is what 
uh, American Family versus Gulkey was, insurance companies are faced with some rather difficult decisions. You have large property losses, uh, you can have major injury cases, and uh, you, you have to make some rather significant decisions early on. Do we subrogate? Do we investigate? Do we conduct an inspection? Do we give notice? And if so, whom do we give notice to and when? And how do we give notice to them? Cause and origin experts may be called in, but this is a, a misnomer because really there is no such thing as a cause and origin expert. We have origin experts who come in, fire investigators, people trained to look at the evidence of fires, alligatoring, uh, drop down fire evidence and patterns within a fire scene to pinpoint where, where a fire started. Not what caused the fire, but where it started. Often insurance companies rely too heavily on cause and origin, cause, cause and origin experts. And many years after a fire, I'll get a subrogation file from a client involving hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars and they'll ask me to subrogate and I'll say, well, do we have an expert? Oh, yes, we have a great cause and origin expert. He pointed out exactly where the fire started, followed the, the fire patterns, used his training and expertise, followed all of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the rules and regulations and protocol, and uh, came to the conclusion that the fire started by that Black & Decker toaster oven. But this expert isn't qualified to tell us what caused the fire only where it started. So that's just a note uh, that we must remember experts play a key role in fire, explosion, flood loss, cases of this nature. Then also insurance companies have to ask themselves, where, what do they do with the evidence? Where do they store it? How long do they store it? And under what conditions? These are all questions that were um, utilized in the uh, and, and discussed in the American Family versus Gulkey case because right after the fire, American Family did their due diligence. They investigated and sent out two cause and origin experts. Those experts took photographs to document the area of the origin. Gulkey Brothers Roofing was the target defendant in this case, and it was alleged by the plaintiffs that they negligently installed plywood roof sheathing around the chimney pipe back in 1994. Immediately, an adjuster from American Family went out and met with Gulkey Brothers in person to find out about this. They were doing their due diligence. They gave notice. American Family's adjuster wrote letters to the Gulkey Brothers on March 13th of 2000, which was uh, just uh, exactly one month after the fire. They sent letters to David, Charles, and Joseph Galkey. The letter stated that the company's negligence caused the fire and gave until April 1st to, do, to come out and investigate it. Charles and Joseph later denied ever receiving those letters, which were sent by US, the U.S. Postal Service regular mail. David, however, did receive it and forwarded a copy of it to Indiana Insurance Company, their liability carrier. Indiana Insurance Company acknowledged the subrogation claim to their insurers, but took no action, or to, to uh, American Family, but took no action to investigate. They even gave a coverage denial. Notice continued because on April 6, 2000, American Family sent out a second notice letter. They were being cautious because nobody had come out to do the inspection and they didn't get any feedback or response from Golke Brothers or their insurer. This second notice requested liability insurance information from Indiana, and it was sent certified mail to the Gulkies. This time, Joseph signed the receipt. He was one of the brothers who first uh, claimed he didn't receive the first letter. Charles, the other Gulkie brother who didn't receive the first notice, left a voicemail for an American family adjuster. So they did receive the notice. The adjuster returned the call and left the voicemail message. Now, they had given a deadline earlier, and that deadline wasn't met. The Ronaldson home was destroyed. It was bulldozed to the ground for rebuilding sometime on April 11th. In the trial court, American Family filed a subrogation action against the Golke brothers, and it turned into a spoliation trial because Indiana Insurance and Golke brothers claimed that American Family tore down the house before Golke brothers and their experts had a chance to get out there 
and find alternative theories for the case besides the work that Golke brothers had done near the chimney. They relied on the Sentry decision, and if you remember back, the Sentry decision involved that confusing case where it could be argued that even negligent action could result in the dismissal of a case. Now we've seen since then that you need intentional and egregious conduct, but they were relying on the Sentry decision which was still out there. The trial court found that American Family could have done more to preserve the evidence. In other words, preserve the chimney and the roof and parts of the sheathing and videotape everything. But the question is one of absurdity because at what point do you think a defendant is going to say, well, I think you preserved enough evidence? In fact, if American Family had preserved the chimney, they would have argued that some of the wiring or the panel box or other appliances near the chimney might have been the cause of the accident. So the question now was begged, exactly what <clears throat> has to be done to preserve evidence and avoid being found responsible for spoliation. The court specifically did not find <clears throat> any evidence of egregious conduct. And that's important because all we had was negligent conduct, not egregious conduct. The Court of Appeals looked at the case and said, we have a rather large block of questions that have to be answered here. And because only the Court of Appeals had addressed spoliation questions in Wisconsin, they certified these questions to be sent to the Wisconsin Supreme Court for a full and final once and for all answer to questions regarding spoliation and the duties of parties to litigation in Wisconsin. Now, understand that Wisconsin is the example state we're using. It's only one of 50 states. We'll go through some of the others uh, quickly, and then I, I think you'll be able to also see from the handout or the material I pointed out to you on the website that um, every state has a different body of law. But the Court of Appeals asked the Supreme Court the following questions. Under what circumstances can evidence crucial to potential le uh, legal claims be destroyed? What notice must be given to a civil litigant before evidence is destroyed? What factors should a court consider in evaluating whether a party's conduct constitutes a flagrant and knowing disregard of the judicial process? Should a court weigh the cost and effort to preserve the evidence in making its decision? And lastly, should a court evaluate only the conduct of the party who allows or causes the evidence to be destroyed because dismissal for spoliation is a sanction, or should a court consider whether the other parties, the Golke brothers in this case, acted reasonably, and whether the other parties did in fact receive notice. At the Supreme Court level, the Golke brothers' attorneys made the following arguments. They said the notice given to them was not legally sufficient. U.S. mail is not proof of actual notice. And if somebody sends notice by actual mail and the party says, I didn't receive it, well, there's no evidence to prove they did receive it. They said that the second notice letter sent, this time by certified mail, was still insufficient because it lacked a cause and origin opinion. And it failed to warn that litigation was imminent. The court, uh, uh, the Gulky brothers said in their brief, Failing a response from the opposing party, which is American Family, American Family should continue to preserve the evidence, presumably forever, was the argument they made in the Supreme Court. They also said that relying upon sentry, no egregious conduct or bad faith should be needed for dismissal. So these were some rather heavy issues that the Supreme Court was now going to have to make a ruling on. Wisconsin reinsurance filed an amicus brief. And an amicus brief is a brief that's filed by a non-party, but a group or organization or insurer who has an interest in the outcome of the case for all time, because the Wisconsin Supreme Court opinion will now set the law in Wisconsin. So Wisconsin Reinsurance um, <clears throat> filed an amicus brief. And the amicus brief uh, was filed by um, uh, Arnie Anderson, who ironically was an old partner of, of ours here at Matisse and Wickard and Lair, and um, they argued that subrogation should only be allowed if it's equitable. So we go back to the old uh, Jurassic arguments against subrogation. 
the court said, or he cited a case that an insurer using subrogation must have superior equity. And while I don't want to get into um, the concepts of equitable versus legal versus statutory subrogation because they are quite different, um, citing old equitable maxims such as you have to have superior equity to subrogate really is quite old and worn out and doesn't really apply. Wisconsin Reinsurance also argued that notice must be equitable. It requires something more than letters via U.S. mail and actual notice. And it does not, and, and, and the, the, courts, the, the Supreme Court needs to address Indiana Insurance Company's actual notice, um, which uh, Wisconsin Reinsurance did not address. But the evidence preservation must also be equitable, they say. The subrogated insurer must retain all evidence in the area of, of origin uh, presumably ad infinitum. So this is a very slippery slope argument because suddenly even moderate sized claims and property losses can become very expensive for insurers, subrogation professionals who are scared that anything they do or don't do will be interpreted as spoliation. At the same time as the Wisconsin Reinsurance Amicus Brief, the National Association of Subrogation Professionals, a national organization of which I served on their board for many years, also was interested in filing an amicus brief and hired Matisse and Wickert and Lair to file that brief. We did, and we urged the court to find that only egregious conduct is sufficient for dismissal of a case. With regard to when we can destroy evidence, we argued that U.S. mail is sufficient and that there has to be merely a notice and opportunity to inspect. And after that, it's too bad, so sad, you snooze, you lose. If you don't come out and inspect and do your due diligence as a potential tortfeasor, you will suffer the consequences. With regard to what, what factors the court should consider, both the context and the costs of the case should be taken into consideration, as, long, as well as any subsequent prejudice to the victim. Now, the Wisconsin Supreme Court made its holding and heard oral arguments by all of the parties. Some of the justice were, justices were troubled by the minimal amount of evidence retained by American family. They withheld only the things that they thought were necessary for their claim. They didn't go in and withhold evidence that, that they thought would hurt their claim or that other potential defendants would later find as alternative causes. Many of the justices were skeptical, however, of the Galkis' unsophisticated defense to notice. I didn't receive it, and even if I did receive it, it wasn't sufficient. It was the old dog bite argument that if uh, you were, uh, the defendant was bit by a dog, I mean a plaintiff was bit by a dog, the defendant would say, well, it's not my dog, but even if it was my dog, it didn't bite you, and even if it did bite you, it didn't bite you very badly. I mean, the justices were troubled by uh, this unsophisticated arguments about notice. They were also troubled by the defendant's inaction, who did nothing despite actual notice in the case. And one of the justices even asked if there could be some sort of intermediate split the baby rule that could be fashioned. The holding, <coughs> the holding was multifaceted and has now established the law of spoliation in Wisconsin. And by the way, this is how spoliation law is created in all 50 states. But for the majority of states, we do not have a clear, definitive, question-answering opinion about all facets of spoliation like this. So many states are still in flux. And in some states, as we'll see in a minute, the law is still pretty much pioneer ground. I mean, we, it's untrod territory where we don't have any answers to any questions. In the Golke case, the court said that notice to potential defendants via first-class mail is appropriate. They said the legislature has long recognized that first-class mail service is an, efficient, is an efficient mechanism that is reasonably calculated to provide actual notice of possible or pending litigation. Notice of mail is usually considered complete upon mailing, not proof of receipt, the court added. They said that evidence of mailing a letter raises a rebuttable presumption that the addressee received the letter. This presumption, can, presumption cannot be overcome without a denial of receipt, the court said, and mere non-remembering of receipt is not enough. <clears throat> so while notice by first-class mail is sufficient 
My suggestion would be give notice by certified mail return receipt requested at a minimum so that you don't even have to worry about it because once you have someone's signature on that green card, you know they received the notice. With regard to the duty to preserve, the court really read and followed almost all of the recommendations that Matisse and Wickard and Lehrer put in the amicus brief on behalf of the National Association of Subrogation Professionals. The court held that the duty to preserve evidence is discharged completely once the party in possession has done the following. Number one, given reasonable notice of a possible claim. Number two, explain the basis for that claim and the existence of ev evidence relevant to that claim. And number three, <clears throat> provided a reasonable opportunity for inspection of the evidence. I cannot tell you the number of cases we have where we have to send out dozens and dozens of notice to various parties who owned products, uh, were in the vicinity at the time, or who manufactured uh, items at or near the origin of a fire or explosion, and have to try and juggle their calendars. We can be there in three weeks, but not in two. And it's like trying to organize a luncheon at work where everybody has their own busy calendars and you can never get anyone together. So all you really have to do is provide a reasonable opportunity, give a date, say be there, and make sure that all of your efforts are reasonable, that you reasonably work with the parties to um, and cooperate with them to give them the opportunity to inspect the evidence. The court also went into discussion of the factors that a trial court may consider in making a ruling with regard to dismissal, which of course now can only be with intentional or egregious acts, or even sanctions, which can be a adverse inference. The court said that a trial court may use its discretion, guided by the totality of the circumstances, to judge the sufficiency of the content of the notice letter. Relevant facts include length of time evidence can be preserved. Uh, in other words, is it a house? Do people need to move back into the house? Is it a piece of equipment that the employer or the insured has that needs to be returned? Maybe they don't own it. Um, ownership of the evidence itself is to be considered prejudice posed to possible adversaries by destruction of the evidence, um, form of the notice, sophistication of the parties involved, and the ability of the party in possession to bear the burden and expense of preserving the evidence. I had a case back in Texas a number of years ago involving a defective Mack truck. And what I did was I had to literally buy the Mack truck from the party who owned it and store it in a large warehouse at great expense, as you can imagine, but it was necessary because of the detailed work that was needed and the fact that they were threatening to put the truck back into operation. Um, after the case was over, we did sell it and uh, actually sold it uh, um, at a reasonably good price for our clients, but uh, again, the court is able to take into consideration the ability of uh, the party in possession to bear the burden and expense of preserving the evidence. Now, <clears throat> these, this decision gives us a good idea of what we have to do involving spoliation claims. But with regard to minimizing spoliation in the future, I think it's important to realize that we have to protect the scene. The first thing you have to do is get in there immediately. If you don't have investigators who are qualified and experienced in this regard, please give us a call. Um, this is what we do around the country. You get out, you preserve the scene, you file a lawsuit and get the court to issue a temporary restraining order and even a preliminary injunction if you have to, but you protect the scene. Um, insured have a knee-jerk reaction when there is a loss. They feel they have to go in and clean up and remove things because somehow they might be at fault. And especially in workers' compensation claims, you have to explain to the employer you have exclusivity protection. You will not be sued uh, cooperating with us and helping us recover a subrogation um, lien in this case will actually help you and your insurance premiums in the future. So protect the scene. 
immediately notify the insured. Don't let your insured waive subrogation de facto by getting rid of evidence, repairing products, putting machines back into service until there's been an inspection. In writing, notify your insured what to do and what not to do. Number two, <clears throat> give notice to all potentially interested parties. Now this is a mouthful because in some cases you can literally have hundreds of parties, products, um, companies with interests who may have some exposure somewhere down the road and Murphy's Law says that the one you don't give notice to may be the one in which you have your best case, against which you have your best case. So this requires a lot, great deal of investigation and research up front. Don't rely on a simple letter. My recommendation is to send notice certified mail so that you have a record of who received notice and they later cannot claim that they didn't receive notice. Third, schedule a joint inspection. Just like scheduling a luncheon at work, this may be difficult. Parties have different schedules, but stick. Give them a reasonable date and time and stick to it. If they really want to inspect it, they'll get someone out there on that date. Give them a sufficient lead time and above all, be reasonable. Um, number four, establish a protocol or chain of custody. <clears throat> this now gets into the expertise of your experts. Your cause and origin expert, um, forensic engineers, mechanical, civil, chemical, uh, electrical, will all have sufficient knowledge, or should, to establish a protocol so that like the, um, like the technician in the, um, um, the case involving the liquid propane system who took all the joints apart, we're, we're not going to have a situation, um, uh, a situation where, and it was the Garfoot case, we're not going to have a situation where your own experts do the spoliating because it will be held against you. You can't simply say, well, we didn't do it. Uh, XYZ Insurance Company didn't spoliate anything, but in fact you did because your agents hired on your behalf did the spoliating for you. Now in some states you may be able to sue parties who spoliate evidence for which you take the fall. But in those situations you're going to have they're going to have to have a duty, a specific duty that's owed to you in a special relationship um, to you. Preserve the key evidence. Photos and video are a minimum. Retain the key physical evidence and any alternate causes when feasible. Again, the court in Gulky Brothers gave us the the criteria on which the court must rely. Parties are not going to agree on what to retain. In fact, it's become part of the art of litigation. Now, whatever you retain uh, is fine. Whatever you don't retain is probably what they're going to claim you should have retained. You can expect that and operate with that as the premise. Murphy's Law will apply. Whatever you don't retain is going to be the cause of the loss, almost assuredly. And lastly, move swiftly to prosecute the claim. File, soon, uh, file suit as soon as an investigation is complete and oral opinions are received. And again, I say oral opinions because we don't want experts' reports in writing. An expert report in writing really ends up meaning that your expert is, is painting himself into a corner without having all of the evidence and may later want to leave that corner and go elsewhere with his opinion. But if his, if his opinions are memorialized in writing, it's going to be hard to do that. <clears throat> now, before we conclude, uh, I would urge you to go back to the, um, and I will show you where it is here, go back to the uh, website for our law firm. And we're on the home page, of course, here, as you can see. Scroll down on the left-hand side, you'll get to the section here that says Spoliation Law in all 50 states. You click on it. And up comes, well, in theory, up will come the, um, the document and it's not coming up on here, but oh, let me do this. 
up comes the document which is entitled Spoliation of Evidence in All 50 States. And this is found on the website and um, can be reproduced for your needs, although I would advise you to just leave it on the website because it, we change it almost weekly as law across the country changes. And you can see that this gives a very brief introduction into <coughs> excuse me, spoliation in all 50 states. Taking a quick look through here, you can see that Alabama on page one defines spoliation as an attempt by a party to suppress or destroy material evidence favorable to the party's adversary. It doesn't indicate whether intentional or negligent acts are required. And Alabama also holds that spoliation may be a cause may be a basis for a cause of action where a third party has negligently destroyed material evidence, but states that adverse inference instructions and discovery sanctions are the remedy when spoliation is charged against an opposing party. So Alabama does recognize a third party tort. Alaska, on page two, uh, in Alaska you can allege spoliation against someone who isn't a party to the underlying civil suit but who is, who is an agent of a party to that suit, and the Supreme Court has explicitly recognized intentional third-party spoliation of evidence lawsuits. On page three, Arkansas uh, defines spoliation as the intentional destruction of evidence, allows only an adverse inference. And in California, you can see that this was the state in which, <coughs> in which evidence was first discovered. I'm sorry, in which uh, spoliation was first created, now no longer recognizes a first party tort of spoliation, does not recognize a third party tort, tort of spoliation, nor does it recognize a tort of negligent spoliation. <clears throat> in Delaware, I give an example of a, um, a, um, you could see a actual um, criminal penalty that's available for tampering with physical evidence, and a person is guilty of tampering with evidence when, and then it gives a definition of how you can violate that criminal code. Um, Florida does not recognize an independent action for spoliation of evidence, whereas Hawaii courts have not resolved whether Hawaii law would recognize a tort of spoliation of evidence. Idaho courts have discussed but not formally recognized or made a decision either way. In Indiana, negligent or intentional spoliation of evidence is actionable as a tort only if the party alleged to have lost or destroyed evidence owed a duty to the person bringing the spoliation claim. So your expert, if he loses it, better have good liability insurance. Um, Kansas. In Kansas, the Supreme Court has concluded that absent some independent tort, contract, agreement, voluntary assumption of duty, or some special relationship, the new tort of spoliation of evidence should not be recognized. But that leaves a rather wide door that you could drive that Mack truck 18-wheeler that I preserved as evidence down in Texas right through. Uh, Louisiana. Louisiana courts have recognized the right of an individual to institute a tort action against someone who has impaired the party's ability to institute or prove a civil claim. And so it goes. Michigan does not recognize a, a separate tort of spoliation. Um, and we can go on and on through um, the uh, handout or the material found on our website. Montana courts have adopted the torts of both intentional and negligent spoliation. And we can move on to New Mexico, where they have recognized the tort of intentional spoliation, or New York, which is of particular interest to those of you handling work cop subrogation, because spoliation by an employer in New York may support a common law cause of action when such spoliation impairs an employee's right to sue a third party tort feeser. So the employee can sue the employer despite the exclusivity rule if the employer commits a separate tort of spoliation as your as its workers' compensation insurer, you must notify the employer of this danger whenever there's a loss. If there's evidence to be retained, simply sitting back may subject that employer to liability for losing or not preserving evidence or putting things back into 
operation too soon before parties have an ability to inspect it. Um, so that's something of interest for those of you uh, handling workers' compensation claims. And in Ohio, uh, the Supreme Court of Ohio holds that a cause of action exists in tort for intentional spoliation um, in that state. So spoliation, as you can see, is a um, danger no matter which side of the docket you are on, whether you're subrogating, whether you are um, liability claims handler, you must always be prepared to deal with the issue of subrogation because it could, as some of my clients have found out, result in a verdict against you for millions of dollars, depending on what state you're in. But more commonly, and just as devastating, is the fact that millions and millions of dollars in liability claims may have to be paid out because evidence is uh, gone and, and in inferences are entered by trial courts against you, or subrogation claims can be ruined because you simply haven't taken the time to, um, to preserve all of the evidence. So uh, that concludes the spoliation seminar. Uh, if you have specific questions, you can always go to our website. Uh, I will point to you right now where on the website you can go. Um, if you go to the website, you're on the home page here you can look down and there is a section right down here and I will highlight it with my handy dandy highlighter. And you can fill this out and click right here and submit any kind of subrogation question you have. Usually you get an answer uh, based on any jurisdiction within North America, usually within 24 hours, often within a matter of an hour or two. We urge you to take advantage of that if you have questions. I have a couple of questions right here. Um, <clears throat> John has asked exactly how do you avoid spoliation when fire has destroyed all of the evidence? Um, John, that gets to the heart of, I guess, what we've been talking about today, and that is that spoliation becomes even more of a risk and even more of a challenge when you have fire, natural disasters, floods, explosions, electricity, which destroys evidence on its own. Um, courts are not going to hold uh, you liable or give you adverse inferences merely because a fire destroys your theory of the case. However, and this is just endemic to fire litigation and subrogation in general, as well as defense of these cases, you do have a burden. You do have the burden of proof as a subrogating plaintiff to prove that uh, the Black & Decker toaster oven did in fact cause your, cause your fire as opposed to the Honeywell um, uh, low voltage um, thermostat or the alarm clock or something else which happened to be in the vicinity of the toaster oven. So you're going to have to meet that burden and that's where prompt investigation uh, preservation of experts, uh, or ret retention of experts, and preservation of uh, accident scenes are to be um, uh, uh, sought after and looked at quickly. Again, when you have a serious catastrophic loss, a fire loss, um, we are always available to assist you in conducting uh, the investigation. We have a database of over 25,000 experts gathered over the last 25 years that are dig digitized organized and searchable not only by area of expertise and geography, in other words, their venue, but also based on how much they cost. And we've categorized them in three different categories. We call them our Hyundai, Ford, and Porsche experts, Not meaning not that they're car experts, but that we have some cheap ones, we have some middle-of-the-road ones, and then we have some very expensive experts. And we want to use the right expert because you cannot spend yourself into a successful subrogation program and you have to be cost effective. Um, I've got one other question here. Oh, and I think I might have just answered it. How do we find uh, the correct expert to give us the cause of a fire once we know its origin? As I mentioned, far too often, probably the number one mistake I see clients make in fire cases is retaining a cause and origin expert who goes in and looks at a fire, uses his experience, points to an origin, and then takes a guess at the cause. 
writes up a report, sends it to the client, and some years later I see the file along with this cause and origin report, and I have to inform the client that the evidence is gone, um, and what we need is a mechanical, electrical, chemical, or even sometimes a civil engineer, because only they will be allowed to testify as experts in the case. Your fire um, uh, expert will not be able to testify as to the cause, but only as to the origin of the loss. Um, Cindy, you've, I see a question here. Uh, Cindy has asked, can we be retained? Yes, we, we can be retained. Uh, Matisse Wicker and Lair does on a regular basis, even for clients we don't regularly handle subrogation work for, go out and conduct an in-depth uh, inspection, investigation, retain experts, establish a protocol, preserve evidence, and also issue a demand letter where requested. Um, we, we certainly can do those things and uh, as well as handle a subrogation file afterwards if, if necessary, but yes, we, we are available to do that. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. I really appreciate uh, everyone's attendance, um, and I urge you to look forward in our coming newsletters for notices and announcements about future webinars that will be offered. Um, thanks, and have a great day.